and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts delve into the insights the data reveal to fuel market disruption and market growth for those in the CPG, retail, healthcare, and media markets. I'm your host, Joan Driggs, coming to you from IRI's corporate headquarters in Chicago. Welcome back to another episode of Growth Insights. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about sustainability in the CPG industry. I'm joined by Randy Kronthal-Sacco, Senior Scholar, Marketing and Corporate Outreach at New York University's Stern Center for Sustainable Business. Prior to academia, Randy had a distinguished career in the consumer goods industry across food and personal care. And it was actually her work at Johnson & Johnson in the baby care division and having children of her own that really kind of struck a chord with her. And she's been embracing both her children and sustainability ever since. We also have um, my good colleague, my good friend and colleague, Larry Levin, um, Executive Vice President of Marker and Shopper Intelligence here at IRI. He's a regular, as we know. Um, But what you might not know is that A, Larry works very closely with NYU's Stern Center for Sustainable Business on the research we're going to talk about today, but he also has some strong ties to sustainability through his past life, helping launch the Toyota Prius and even working for the California Recycling Commission. So welcome, Randy and Larry. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Thanks, Joan, and uh, honored to be here again as well. Thanks. So last week, the two of you presented the state of sustainability in CPG. Is it sustainable? Um, Which is a recorded webcast available at iriworldwide.com. Highly encourage you to visit there. Uh, But Randy, based on that webinar, and I want to start with you, the research you conducted kind of set out to prove the positive return on investment of sustainability. Although you kind of called it return on sustainability investment. So ROSI, which I kind of like, instead of ROI. Um, So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. um, Thank you, Joan. We at Stern Center for Sustainable Business uh, wanted to prove the ROSI, that ROSI outlook for your investment in sustainability. And typically when you're measuring sustainability, you're measuring more the tangible benefits. So if someone reduces greenhouse gases, obviously that has a payback. But what we wanted to do at, with our ROSI methodology is to incorporate everything, both the tangible and the intangible benefits, because they're significant. And what we say is that when a company embeds sustainability into its core strategy, there's a number of benefits. For instance, you have a more loyal customer base. What we know is when a company embeds sustainability in its core business strategy, there's lots of benefits. For example, uh, your customer loyalty is greater. Employee relations are improved. We, uh, you have strong, particularly the younger generation, really only want to work for companies that do good. So to get the best and the brightest, you really need to have a strong sustainability strategy. We spoke with a CEO of Patagonia recently who said for, and I can't recall the number, but it was a small number of summer internship positions available. They got something like tens of thousands of applications because the best and the brightest and everyone wants to work for Patagonia. So we know that it improves um, employee relations and productivity and retention. Um, you also have additional innovation. We worked with a paper company who used FSC certified uh, good forestry management practices, but found that one of their, um, their outputs actually was something that could go on mulch and became a, so this is circular economy, became um, a revenue generator for them. So trash became a revenue. Um, you get better media coverage. We already know about the operational efficiencies, lower risk. Um, and all that 
translates into better and higher revenues, which we'll talk about today. All that translates into higher profitability, um, better valuations. Some banks are actually lending good actors at lower costs of capital than others because they feel like the risk to lend is lower. And so all that in general delivers better short-term and long-term valuation, hence our rosy methodology. You know, just playing on that, though, I think one other aspect is what it does for the consumer, because there's incredible brand equity that's built up by companies that have a sustainable platform. I mean, take Unilever, I think, the quintessential leader in sustainability and equity that it's built up with consumers. And, you know, Randy came at it from the demand of younger people wanting to work for companies that have a sustainability mindset platform, but that's a small percentage relative to the big percentage of younger people in particular that want to buy products from those companies. So, and, and they're looking at those companies to set uh, meaningful and mindful brand stories that they can connect with and that will want to connect with those products. So Larry, how are we defining sustainability or sustainable in CPG? And I guess even more importantly, is it the same way that consumers define sustainability? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, the one thing that we're not saying is, is sustainable. If you're just natural, you're not sustainable. Okay, you you have to have a seal of non-GMO or uh, antibiotic free or fair trade, avoiding testing with animals. Uh, Randy can expand on this a lot better than I can, but. Importantly to the consumer, it also means both a point of view of better for the environment, but also being a better corporate citizen. And, you know, we, Randy and I touched a little bit about this last week on our webinar. There's been a growth in societal importance. A lot of this is coming out of the equality movements that we've seen, whether it's Black Lives Matter or all inclusion, or even the Washington Redskins finally dropping the name Redskins. And so there's a lot of growth, still relatively small, but 15 to 20% of the population is looking for companies that are socially responsible, as well as creating products that are sustainable. Okay. So Randy, then I'm going to turn to you a little bit, and maybe you can even like focus in on some of the products that were included in this study, just so we get a sense of what are we looking at in terms of sustainability? Yeah. So what we did is, uh, and you'll hear more about this on the, if you look at the slides or listen to the uh, webinar, but we took a look at claims on PAC. And the reason that we looked at claims on PAC is because that's kind of ubiquitous that you, uh, if you're interested in being a uh, conscious consumer, you will look at the product to see what what claims are being made, um, as opposed to advertising that may be a targeted effort. And we delineated from sustainability things, we, we put it into two buckets, um, sustainability is environmental and sustainability is social. So environmental could be anywhere from uh, organic practices to, um, to um, FSC certified, which I talked about earlier, uh, good forestry management for paper products to non-GMO, uh, whereas uh, social sustainability often is fair trade practices or gender equality. Um, starting to see some interesting sustainable claims around uh, carbon labeling, which we had not seen in the prior, uh, prior uh, research that we issued. Um, but I would say it falls into two buckets. Either they're making claims on environmental or social. Uh, we did not, um, as Larry said, include uh, natural because we do know consumers don't really understand what natural is. And we didn't include a clean label if that was the only thing consumer that the, pet, the, the corporation mentioned because clean label could be two ingredients, but one of the two ingredients really could be insidious. Got it. Good. So I know that we're going to be talking more about like this new research, but this is the second wave of, of research. And the first wave you launched last year at our summit. Um, so that was based on mostly like 2018 and 2019 work. What, what did you find in that first wave? 
So what was so significant is um, the contribution of sustainably marketed products to growth at CPG. And um, I, when I came in, I was, could not find any data that looked at CPG and said the percent of products actually being purchased by uh, consumers. We found a lot of data in terms of survey and people's intentionality, but not actual purchases. So what we found in the first wave is that uh, sustainably marketed products account for about 16% of the market. I must say it was a bit lower than what I had thought, given the number of people who say that they are conscious consumers. Um, but what was really stunning was the fifth, that that 16% translated to 50% of growth from 2013 to 2018 in CPG. So 16% translated to 50% of the growth. And when you have a sleepy category up until <laughs> COVID this year, but when you have a sleepy category that's growing for CPG one to 2% a year, and you're saying half of the growth is coming from just 16% of the market, that was really incredible. I will also say that, um, we received lots of interest in that number from not just manufacturers and retailers in the CPG space, but investment banks and investment and asset management companies and related industries because everybody needs to deliver growth for their shareholder. And this is saying how important it is to growth and to the future consumer. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, Larry, what is it? about sustainable or sustainability, what are consumers specifically looking for? I mean, you mentioned some of the broader social things, but in terms of products, what is it that people are looking for? Well, I think they're definitely looking for non-GMO. They're looking for antibiotic-free. And again, I think they're looking for companies that bring that positioning around things like, I've got a commitment to renewable resources, or I'm you know, I, I am uh, minimizing uh, the effect on the environment. So they're looking for products that serve one part of their need, but then looking for a company that comes from an overarching view of the importance of it. And, and the thing that I, I think we're starting to really see the dividends, I, I love the fact that Randy and team came up with 50% growth. And this year, Joan, as you know, it's the first time in Pace Setters, our new product innovation review that we've seen so many products with sustainable positioning. You know, three of our top 10 food and two of our top 10 non-food had products that were sustainable. I, I, you know, I think about uh, Purdue and its, and its product, you know, some of the, the work that was done uh, with, with Pampers, for example, by P&G. But importantly, when you look at these food and beverage products, 25 of the top 100 had a sustainable positioning to them. And when non-GMO was an attribute, the average uh, sale, the average first-year sales for those type of products was over $40 million, compared to products that didn't have a non-GMO positioning at $32 million. So right off the bat, you know, one can argue there's an $8 million dividend, if you will, for having a product that has a non-GMO positioning. And it will continue to watch that evolution in new product pay centers, but I was really fascinated by that trend that we saw just by looking through pay centers. Well, it is. I know that your research is, you know, far broader and you've got, what is it, like 36 categories or something that you're tracking. So it is interesting to kind of drill into some of these specific products that are really the cream of the crop in terms of new launches and sales. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about the research that you just unveiled. and. And I, I get the sense that maybe there was a, a sense of trepidation that maybe with COVID-19, people would abandon their, their commitment. Um, but Randy? What? Yeah, we, we, I certainly was concerned about that. I think people, we saw unprecedented growth in CPG. And the question that was raised was, are they going to continue to do the right thing or are they just going to, or consumers just going to be buying up, pantry loading, buying up everything. And what we found is that, uh, yes, this sustainability did survive the pandemic, that uh, in fact, uh, sustainability uh, marketed products grew 
points, two share points up to close to 19% uh, during the COVID period, which was sort of the month of uh, March. And that was really uh, sustainability, sustainability marketed products all time high. So it was at the expense of conventionally marketed. But when you look at actual dollar increase, so not just the share increase, but the dollar increase because the market increased so much, um, period to period was up 56%. So really a stunning increase. And I believe total CPG was 30 to 40%. And you know what's interesting about that, and Joan, you know it well because we partner on a lot of our thought leadership survey work, but in survey work over the last month or two, as many people continue to say they're going to buy sustainable products like they always have, but 7 to 8% also said they're going to buy more of it. So even though we're in a time where people are struggling financially, we still saw the foundational base remain strong. and another 7 to 8%, which if you look at more than half are going to stay strong, that's almost a 10% increase in the amount of people are going to buy. So you and I always like to say value for the money doesn't mean cheap. Value for the money means make my life better. And sustainable products in the immediate term and in the longer term make a consumer's life better. So, and, and that really does beg another question around the recession that we're in because I associate sustainable products or some of those messages with a higher price point. So is this another layer of fear or do you think we don't have anything to be concerned about? Yeah, uh, this research actually did show that sustainably marketed products are priced higher than their conventional counterparts. And on a weighted average basis, it's close to 40%. Um, And that gap has widened over time. So the premium has increased. Um, What we we understand is that conventionally marketed products actually have taken more price this year. It's basically been flat the past five years. So my expectation is the price will shrink. The price gap will shrink. Still a premium. The premium is broad. Some categories, it's 3%. Some categories like carbonated beverage, it's up to 164%. Um, we will be doing more research in this area uh, to see when the price gap lessens, does volume increase? It could operate very much like a luxury good where it's sort of inelastic and, and price changes don't impact volume. But we will, uh, Larry and I will be reporting on that early 2021. It is, it is a concern. Uh, we will need to monitor that. We did, as part of this work, I will say, we did look at price sensitivity and food prices, food products that are sustainable seem to be quite uh, insensitive or less sensitive to price than uh, products that aren't. So if you were in the food category, you should be thinking that uh, there's not going to be a lot of impact. And if you... You It's interesting you say that because it, it takes me back to the Prius days. And I know Joan kind of talked about the fact that I was involved in the first Prius work. And I remember now that you say that people initially didn't recognize the Prius to be a, um, an electric car or a hybrid at the time. And so they thought that the Prius was worth $18,000 when they just looked at it. But when we told them it was hybrid, they were willing to pay $2,500 more. And when you think about the price of a car, and be willing to spend another you know, 10 to 15%, that's pretty powerful because, again, they saw the benefit of needing less gasoline, better for the environment. People are willing to make an investment in their families' lives and the lives of everybody around them, and they'll spend a little bit more money for that. Well, and I would guess, too, that at that peak stock up of the pandemic, people were willing to spend a premium on toilet paper, that was sustainable because it was maybe available for a while. Absolutely. And there are a number of good players in the paper category that do use FSC certified. A lot of the big players, a lot of Kimberly Clark products. So when they were stocking up, they were stocking up on sustainably marketed products. Okay. So what about this research, like the second wave of research really surprised you? Well, I was I was 
happily surprised that some of the big legacy players over the past year have started to adopt sustainably uh, sustainability messages. I strongly encourage the legacy brands to start to adopt sustainable products and com- practices and communicate them to the consumer. You're ne- we're never going to move from 16% to 50% to 75% if the big, big guns, the big guys aren't, um, aren't making changes and just these niche products. They're either buying up niche products or doing line extensions, but not converting their their core business. I know it's risky. I've been there. I've run big businesses. But if you do, if they don't make the change, it will eventually catch up to them. There's been transformation in a number of categories where uh, this is, where the conventionally marketed products were surprised at um, and have seen share uh, hits because sustainably marketed products have come in and taken share away from them. Can you, can um, you give us an example of one of those yeah. categories? Uh, both diapers and uh, sanitary napkins saw big introductions in sustainably marketed products and which transformed the category. Yeah. And in both cases, big players have purchased them, but I would rather the big players start adopting. I would, in addition, say, don't wait until transformation comes in and hits you. We'll come really be at the forefront. We are actually at this interesting place in time, too, with the recession a lot of companies are removing SKUs, you know, just really focusing on their higher selling mm-hmm. products. But at the same time, this is where they start to look around and see where's my innovation going to come from. And maybe it is purchasing some of those smaller companies that are already in the space you want to be in or investing in the innovation it takes to compete, you know, with your muscle in that category. So you're absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Anything else? I mean, one of the things that you mentioned actually, Randy, was the the carbon footprint, you know, as kind of like a a claim or that people might be looking at it from a company standpoint. Um, But I think that there's, there's more of that that I really haven't heard too much of. Yeah, Unilever just made a big uh, statement that's, I believe it was something like 70,000 SKUs will start to identify the carbon footprint and that that people will make choices around that. Um, Church and White is another company that's starting to put um, renewable energy made hundred with hundred percent renewable energy. We are uh, in a situation where climate change is a um, important uh, issue for particularly the younger users, and um, and this will be a compelling benefit to them. Right. And then, so do you want to talk a little bit about what you see coming up for your next iteration of this research? I mean, what what work do you want to continue to do? I'm very interested. So this was done um, in the measure channels of IRI. We did not look at the e-channels, and I really want to see what happens with the e-retailers and how that, whether people are making the same choices around sustainability it, with the products that they are getting delivered to their home as they are when they go into the store. Um, I would encourage any e-retailers to start to communicate the sustainability benefits of all the products they offer and be as transparent as possible. But I'm very interested in that dynamic. Historically, CPG was not a big part of, although, albeit growing, but not a big part of total packaged goods purchases. I think that changed this year. So I'm very interested in understanding well, that. For yeah, sure. there's no e-commerce doubt it changed. is a big winner coming out of the pandemic, but I think a, an additional layer of complexity and maybe um, a, a challenge is the packaging that goes with home delivery, right? Yes. And in fact, we've done some survey work separately, and that's suggesting that people are very concerned about the amount of packaging that they're receiving through their e-retailer. But you know, it's also interesting that manufacturers continue to be on board because I was talking to one of our client leads today on one of our biggest uh, partner clients, and sustainability has always been a barrier to buying its flagship product, but the manufacturer is heavily focused on redoing its packaging so that it's completely sustainable. 
because they understand that's an impetus to growth. It's and it's it's a need to connect with the younger consumer on this staple product category. That's great. So what I want to, I kind of want to recap a little bit, um, some of the things that I heard today, and that is your overriding message of sustainability is good for business. Um, and I will say that that Patagonia internship, you know, all those tens of thousands of people, they were probably also in it for the discount. So (laughs) (laughs) the Patagonia do good. Um, but that, okay, this, the sustainability research that you presented last week, and that's on our website, is around both environmental and social. Um, that's part of your research. Um, most of what consumers are looking for tend to be things like non-GMO, antibiotic-free, um, but also companies that are trying to reduce their, their carbon footprint, which I think is going to be growing, um, that sustainability has weathered the pandemic, which is fantastic. Um, It's up two share points, so close to 19% during that peak pandemic stock up period, which really um, translated to more than 50% growth in in dollar sales, which is phenomenal. Um, I think a a barrier is still that premium price. You mentioned up to 40% on sustainable products um, that could come down. I hope it comes down and make it more accessible to other people. Um, and that there's no time like right now during a pandemic and during a recession to innovate or at least acquire some of those smaller startups that really play well in this space. For listeners, please visit iriworldwide.com and check out the webinar, The State of Sustainability in CPG. Is it sustainable? I think we now know the answer is yes. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, as always. Thank you, Larry. Wonderful relationship. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insights. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.